Anyway, I'm so glad you're here on this Palm Sunday morning. We're going to put our uh, sermon series on hold for a couple of weeks as we celebrate Easter. Uh, But I heard a little Easter story, a, a funny little story about a little boy that got sick on Palm Sunday. And he stayed home from church to be with his mom. Well, his father went to church. He returned from church with a palm branch in his hand. And the little boy was curious. He said, Dad, why do you have a palm branch? And his dad said, well, son, you see, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him, to glorify him. So we got palm branches today. The little boy thought about it for a minute. He says, oh, shucks, Dad, the one Sunday I miss is the Sunday Jesus shows up. (laughs) Well, let me put your mind at ease today. Jesus is here today. He's showing up just as much today because the Bible tells us he shows up anytime we lift up his name. Amen? Matter of fact, he's there when we expect him to be. He's there when we don't expect him to be sometimes. The truth is, when it comes to our Lord, he's before us. He's behind us. He's to at our side. He's at our side. He's below us. He's around us. And today, I believe that gives us reason to celebrate. Amen? Because he is an omnipresent God. He's present everywhere at the same time. And this week is really a huge, huge week. I call it the Super Bowl of Christianity. Yeah, it's Easter week. It's Holy Week. It really is the best time of the year. It's the best time of year. I love celebrating Easter and what it means and what and who we celebrate. And it begins for us today by considering the cross. We're going to focus on the cross and what it means. But I'll say this as we get started. It's kind of sad to say that a lot of times the message of the cross and its power gets lost. It gets lost in our busyness, or sometimes we just get desensitized to the cross. Maybe it's because we've heard so much about the cross over and over again. Maybe it's because we see millions of crosses on church steeples. Maybe it's because uh, it's on the graves of believers. It's on jewelry. It's on t-shirts. It's on sweatshirts. It's on hats. And those things are great. Those things are great, but sometimes I'll say that without even knowing it, we miss the message, the powerful message of the cross. So I think it's a good thing when we can take time on a Palm Sunday morning to talk about the cross and hopefully realize and see it in a brand new light than ever before. That's what I wanted to do today, this Sunday before Easter. I want us to go back and I want us to look at the cross because that's really what our faith is all about. Without the cross, we wouldn't have faith. I think it's interesting, though, that every religion, every worldwide religion, has some kind of image or some kind of symbol that represents who they are. The Buddhist, their symbol is the lotus flower, and they typically have a depiction of Buddha in the middle of an open lotus flower, which symbolizes birth and death, which kind of goes along with their wrong thinking on reincarnation. Judaism, their symbol is the Star of David. It's really two triangles making a six-sided star. So anytime you see the Star of David, you think of Judaism. Another recognizable symbol is the crescent moon and the star. It's a symbol of Islam. It's a symbol of the Muslims. But I would guess that most of us are more acquainted with the Christian symbol. Amen? The symbol of Christianity, and that's right here. That's right there. It's the cross. It's right there. It's everywhere in this building. But I found out that it wasn't until the 6th century that the cross became the symbol for Christianity. The 6th century. Before that, you know what it was? It was the ultimate symbol of shame and degradation because the worst of criminals were hung on a cross. It was an instrument of execution. It was a humiliating symbol. I guess it would be kind of like wearing a tiny gold-plated electric chair on a necklace around our neck or a hangman's noose or a guillotine. I know that's kind of morbid, but that's kind of what they thought of the cross back then. But even today, I'll say this, this, it's a strange symbol to the world because of what it represents. It's a strange symbol. The Apostle Paul put it this way, 1 Corinthians 1.18. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. He says, To those that don't want to have anything to do with the cross or Jesus Christ, it's foolishness. To those that are perishing, but to us who that are being saved, it's the power of God. Skip down to verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block 
to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. That scripture means the whole idea that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would be crucified was a stumbling block to the Jews. They couldn't imagine, they couldn't conceive that the Messiah would be hung on a cross of shame. So it was something that tripped up their faith. It tripped up their faith on what they believed the Messiah was going to be like, who he was going to be. I like this. Someone put it this way. They said, no other religion has at its heart the humiliation of its God. The humiliation of its God. You don't find that in any of the other religions. The cross, this symbol of humiliation, is the focal point that God has used throughout all of history. So today, I'm just reminding us we cannot lose the value of the cross. We cannot lose sight of the cross. The crucifixion of Jesus was a very visual experience. You could not only see it, you could hear it, and I would imagine you could feel it. And I believe it would have been an absolute shock, a total shock, for any of us to have witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I've, ever, I've even heard people say things like, God, I understand our need for you, you're God. But I don't quite get this whole deal about Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to press into today. That's what we're going to look into a little bit deeper. So today I want to do something a little bit different as we begin. For just a few minutes, I want to go back to the day that it happened. And I want you to get a visual account, uh, a reminder of that day from someone who was there. So I want you to listen to this recording, and I want you to listen to it close, and I want you, you to let it touch your heart. Could you listen real quick? I am a Roman soldier, and I was there that day. I was there that day when that man, Jesus, was crucified. I have seen many executions just like it many times before. In fact, we Romans, we have crucified thousands upon thousands of people all over. It happens to be one of those unsavory duties of us Roman soldiers. Some soldiers are desensitized to it, and they actually like it. They can take out their aggressions and their frustrations every time there's an execution. But not most. And not me. And certainly, not this time. If you've ever seen a crucifixion, it's a miserable spectacle to watch a man bleed out sometimes lasting for several days, fighting for each breath, gasping and groaning hour after hour. And this man was different. This execution was different. I've heard many a man hanging from a cross say many things, usually words I couldn't repeat here. But this man looked up to the sky and said to someone, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And I thought, forgive them? Who says that while they're being killed? Even one of our own centurions, when it was all over, said something that made me nervous. He said, truly this man was the Son of God. I heard him say those words, the Son of God. He didn't say, a son of the gods. No, he was very particular. It was singular, the Son of God. It made me nervous because I thought, if this really was the Son of God, where is he now? What does this mean? And what's coming next? I will never forget the sound of the hammers hitting the iron stakes through this one man. Hearing the sound of those spikes being driven, it's hard to listen to. I don't know how many of you have seen The Passion of the Christ, but I remember years ago watching The Passion of the Christ when it came out. And I think that's really where I got my real revelation of what happened to Jesus and what he went through. And they tell me that wasn't even near all that he went through. And it was terrible. I wanted to scream at that movie. If you saw the movie, I wanted to scream at that movie and tell those Roman soldiers to stop. To stop it right now because this man was innocent. He had done nothing wrong. The only thing he was guilty of was love. The only thing Jesus was guilty of was his love for this world. His love for all of us. Those soldiers did three things. That day that I believe revealed the evil of mankind. The evil of mankind that started from the beginning. 
The first was, of course, when they whipped Jesus 39 times. 39 lashes they gave Jesus, this innocent man. And it was believed if you whipped a man 40 times, it would result in death. If you know anything about that whip that they used, it was these leather straps that had metal balls on the end. It had pieces of uh, glass. It had pieces of bone embedded in the leather so that when it hit Jesus' back, it would pull out chunks of flesh. It would do that much damage. And when they whipped him, the blood began to fall. Their goal was to beat him within an inch of his life. I might as well say inch of his death. And Jesus had to be near death to go through a punishment like that. Amen? And the third thing that he went through, and no, I didn't miss the second. We'll come back to that. The third thing was the crucifixion. His back was shredded like ribbon with giant open wounds oozing with blood. And then the soldiers loaded the cross beam of the cross onto his back and marched him up all the way up Calvary's hill to the place of Golgotha, the place of the skull where he would be executed, where he would be crucified. And as hard as that is, those soldiers were doing their job. As horrible as it was, but something as equally cruel and terrifying happened between the first thing they did and the third thing that they did. And I'm going to read about that in Matthew 27, verse 26. It says, Jesus was beaten with whips and handed over to the soldiers to be crucified. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's palace, and they all gathered around him. They took off his clothes and put a red robe on him. Using thorny branches, they made a crown, put it on his head, and put a stick in his right hand. Then the soldiers bowed before Jesus and made fun of him, saying, Hail the king of the Jews. They spat on Jesus. Then they took his stick and they began to beat him on the head. After they finished, the soldiers took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. I want you to get the picture. 20 or 30, maybe more soldiers gathered around Jesus, surrounded him like a mob, kicking him, punching him, mocking him, like the cruelest bunch of bullies surrounding an innocent child on a school playground, or maybe like a gang fight where they were delighting in his pain until he was barely conscious. But then Jesus, who would have been barely able to stand at that time after going all through all that he went through, probably quivering with pain. And let me say this, who in their right mind would spit on someone that was dying? I think even today, spitting in someone's face is the ultimate act of disrespect. But there stood Jesus, spit covering his face. Remember, he's the Son of God. And they did that just for the pleasure of doing it. We all know that spitting isn't intended to hurt anybody physically. Spitting was intended to degrade the soul, and it does. And then you know what they did? According to the Scripture, they knelt before him as if he was a king. It's like they're having an all-out celebration to mock Jesus. And they're doing this to the perfect, loving, sinless Son of God. Amen? Then after all of that, Jesus steps to Calvary as a lamb to the slaughter. I tell you, when I revisit this whole thing, when I'm preaching about it, when I'm thinking about it, I think of what Jesus went through to get to Calvary. And I don't know about you, but when I think about it, I get angry. I get angry. I think these people need to pay. I think these need, people need to pay for what they did to my Lord and my Savior. But let me finish with who should pay. Who's at fault? Who's responsible? Who did this to Jesus? We can start with the list of names being Pontius Pilate. He was in charge, right? The buck could have stopped there. And Pilate, the Bible says, knew why they wanted to kill Jesus. Why the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus. It was because of envy. They were jealous of Jesus because he was more popular. He was more powerful than they were. But the Bible tells us that Pilate found no fault in Jesus. But he still went along with the crowd. Amen. He went along with the crowd. Or we could say it was those bloodthirsty Roman soldiers that were responsible because it was by their hands that they committed that execution, that crucifixion. 
And the level of hatred and humiliation that they threw at Jesus was beyond belief. Listen to how Isaiah describes what Jesus went through in Isaiah 52, 14. It says, His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and His form marred beyond human likeness. You couldn't even tell Jesus was a man when they got through with Him. We could point at them and say they did it. Or we could point at those Jewish leaders. We could point at the high priest Caiaphas, the priest Annas. We could pre point at the Sanhedrin. They were the one that brought down the ruling. They lied and they bribed others to lie so that they could manipulate the government to do what they wanted the government to do. Don't forget the crowd. We could definitely blame the crowd. They had heard his teachings. They had seen his miracles. Many of them had been healed by Jesus, but just like people are today, they were fickle. And they were swayed in that moment. Every person in that crowd was worked up into a frenzy. To where they were ch chanting and they were, they were yelling out, Crucify him! Release Brabus the murderer to us and crucify Jesus! Or we could blame Judas. He was in Jesus' inner circle. And we know he did it for the money. And it was blood money. He even betrayed Jesus with a kiss to identify him to the authorities. What I'm saying today is there are a lot of places we could point our fingers. There are a lot of people that we could blame. But who's responsible? Who is responsible? You're looking at him. I am responsible. You are responsible. We are all responsible. And if you want to know who's responsible for Jesus' death, look in a mirror. It'll show you the full picture. 1 Corinthians 15 plainly tells us He died for our sin. He died for my sin. He died for your sin. We put Him on that cross. We put Him on that cross. He went through what He went through because of you, because of me. I like this quote by John Stott. Uh, from London, England. He said this. He said, before we can ever begin to see the cross as something done for us, we need to see the cross as something done by us. Think about it. It's only when we become aware of our sin that we are grateful and we are thankful that we have a Savior. Amen? Think about it. It's only when we realize how sinful we are, how bad we are, that we realize how good God is, how awesome our God is. Here's something else that I learned recently. might surprise you. But every year or every few years, they add different words to the dictionary. I mean, new words that haven't been used before. One stood out to me was selfie. That hadn't been around too long. But they put new words in the dictionary. But I found out they also take words out of the dictionary. And I found out recently that the Oxford Junior Dictionary removed the word sin from its dictionary. You know what their reason was? It had fallen into disuse, they said, and it's not recognized by the younger generation anymore. I guess since the world has decided that there's no such thing as sin, why haven't the dictionary? And you know what's even scarier? There are churches out there that are not preaching about sin. They are not preaching about a need for repentance. And maybe that's why so many people are believing today that they're not sinners and that they don't need a Savior. But unless you realize that we are separated from God by our own sinfulness, we're not going to see our need for the Son of God, for the Savior of the world. And let's be honest, how many of us have said, you know, I'm not that bad of a person? At least compared to so-and-so, I'm not that bad of a person. Or we'll hear a message preached and we'll say, I hope sister so-and-so was listening to that one. We do that. Not admitting that we have any sin in our own life, of course. Or we'll watch the news and we'll say, that person that those policemen arrested, he's a bad dude. But compared to him, I'm not so bad. You know, we as people have a habit of comparing ourselves to others that we think are worse than us, that are bad, that I'm not so bad at all when I compare myself to them. But have you ever compared yourself to a holy God? Scripture tells us in Isaiah 64, 6, that all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Even the best things that you and I could ever do are like filthy rags. Our righteousness are like filthy rags. It's like filthy rags. You may not know this, but sin came into the world a long time ago, way back in the book of Genesis, 
when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And you remember when they sinned in the garden? They had to be clothed with animal skins. You know why? The reason was something had to die to cover their sin. And do you realize before that moment of sin, there was no death in this world? Sin brought death into this world, and because of that sin, we now live in a fallen world. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, and something had to die to pay for our sins. Well, Jesus was that something. Jesus was that some, someone. He stood up as the spotless Lamb of God to be sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. Yesterday, today, and forever. And when Jesus came, he did something that no religion, no ritual could ever do. He removed guilt, shame, and sin. Colossians 2.13 says, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all. Can you say all? He forgave us all our sins, having canceled. Can you say canceled? Canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. I believe when Paul wrote this, he was actually referring to a, a custom that was done way back in the Greek world. When somebody owed somebody a debt, there was a handwritten signed certificate of debt, and when that debt was paid, a note was sent out, a notice was sent out that the debt had been paid, the debt had been canceled. It's like they're saying, there's no debt anymore. It's gone, it's removed, paid in full. This morning, do you realize that we all have a note of debt? You know what that is? It's our sin. And you know what the payment of that debt is? Like the scripture said, it's death. We have a debt to pay for those sins, and that debt is our death. You know, the truth is, you and I should have been hanging on that cross. Every person in this world should have been hanging on that cross instead of Jesus, paying the price that he paid for us. He was the one that hung on that cross. But God the Father wiped out that note of debt. He nailed it to the cross. You realize today we don't have to die anymore for our sins? Because Jesus came, paid the price, he died for my sin. And even on the cross he said, it is finished. It's done, it's completed, it's paid in full. God treated his own son as a sinner. Jesus was spotless, he had done no sin. So that Christ could make us acceptable to God. Why in the world would he do that? He didn't have to do that. Do you realize that? Well, John 3.16 tells us the motivation b behind why he did what he did. For God so loved the world. I could stop there. For God so loved the world. For God so loved me. For God so loved you. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. That's amazing. Amen. But did you notice there's a condition there? Whoever believes in him, even the death of Christ on the cross doesn't save you unless you believe in him. Just his death won't save you unless you believe in him, unless you put your faith in him. And it's more than believing facts about Jesus. A lot of people do that. The Bible tells us in James 2.19 that even the demons believe in Jesus. They're not saved, but they believe in Jesus. So to trust in Christ means to wholeheartedly rely on Him. To turn your life completely over to Him. To put your whole life in His hand. Don't we do that about every day, every time we fly in an airplane? You're trusting that pilot to get you and that plane back down to the ground safely, right? You trust a doctor when you take the medicine he prescribes that he kind of knows what he's talking about. We trust a lawyer when we let him represent us in court. Well, you know what? God says, I'm doing the same with my son Jesus Christ. And in that same way, when you trust in my son, you're saved from your sin. The cross means that this old life is over. You're not who you used to be when you accept Christ. Amen? Yeah, we're a work in progress, but we're not who we used to be, and we don't ever have to go back to who we used to be. It means you're a brand new you. It means you let go of the old man, and you decide you're going to follow Jesus every day. Think about the cross for just a minute. The cross is God's way of saying, you can have your sin, or you can have my son. You can have your sin, or you can have your son, but you can't have both. So today, as I close, I want to ask you a question. What does the cross mean to you today? Think about it. Is it 
a symbol, of re- a religious symbol? Is it something you wear around your neck? Or is the message of the cross etched upon your heart? Is it etched upon your heart? Does it go deep down in your soul today? You know, when Jesus came, He gave all He had. He brought all He had. And with His nail-scarred hands and His torn body, He offers us forgiveness and acceptance. So I believe when we're looking and hearing about the cross today, I believe God is asking us, His people, and maybe if you're not even a child of God yet, you haven't accepted Him, He's asking for a response. We need to respond. In order for the cross of Christ to be the cross of our life, we have to bring something. Jesus brought something. We have to bring something to Him. We have to bring ourselves. Sins and all. And do you realize that God does more than just remove our mistakes? He does more than just forgive our mistakes, our sins. He removes them. All we have to do is bring them to Him. Amen? Just bring them to Jesus. So my question today is, what are you struggling with? We're all battling with something, I know that. What are you having a hard time letting go of in your life? What sin might it be that's gripping you and you can't get set free from it? What is it that you can't forgive in others or maybe forgive in yourself? Today, God wants you to bring it to Him. God wants you to lay it at the foot of the cross to receive His answers, to receive His forgiveness. And before we take communion today, I always like to allow a little bit of time for us to examine our hearts. Time for us to repent, get things right with God. To do some house cleaning, and I'm not talking about your house at home. I'm talking about the house that Jesus lives in. Amen. Your life and your heart. He wants us to examine our hearts, our lives, our behaviors, our motives, our faith today. And today, I don't want just communion to be another thing we do out of ritualism, just another custom that we follow, tradition that we follow. Today, I want this communion that we're about to take to be special. I want it to be personal. Do you realize that everything Jesus did for us was personal? He was wounded for our our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Everything Jesus did was for us. Everything he did. So I know that Jesus is here right now to meet your deepest need, to bring forgiveness, to bring meaning to your life, to give you a reason to live, to bring healing if you need that. And most of all, he connects us with God in a closer way than ever before. So this morning we stand at the cross, just like we were there 2,000 years ago. Jesus died so that our old self could die. And he rose again so that we could be raised into a newness of life. Amen? A newness of life. You're not who you used to be. He connects us with God. And today we're celebrating that in Holy Communion. But like I say, and we're going to give you a moment to examine your heart, to get right with God. And I would like to invite everyone to join us in communion that has made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. And if you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, even before we start the communion process, I'm going to lead us all through a prayer because I believe there are people in this house today that are either wanting to recommit their life to Christ or wanting to commit their life to Christ right now. So I want to lead you in a prayer. God never gets tired of hearing this prayer because it's leading people to Him. Could we bow our heads and our hearts in prayer? Could we all repeat this together? Lord Jesus... I ask you to come into my heart. And I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I thank you for dying for me. For dying on that cross. I thank you for being bruised. For being beaten. And for dying on that cross so that I could be saved. Lord, I ask you to be my Lord ask you to be my Savior, ask you to forgive me of my sins, in Jesus' name. This morning, I'd like the ushers to come forward and uh, prepare to serve the uh, communion elements if they would. And uh, most of you have been here when we've served communion. Uh, We're going to start at the back, and uh, the usher, Jim's going to dismiss both rows in the back from both sides at the same time. You'll come down the front, 
receive your elements and then peel off to the outsides and go back to your seat. And I would ask you to hold on to the elements until we've all been served so that I can pray over them, so I can bless them before we take them together. But I want to give you a moment to examine your hearts, and uh, I think this, good little, this little video is a good way to do that. It's called Chain Breaker. Take a look at this. I know this is a somber moment, and it should be. But it also should be a moment of celebration. To realize, and I realize it, my God is my chain breaker. Jesus broke my chains of sin. Jesus broke the chains of everything that I had done wrong in life when I turned my life over to Him. Am I perfect? No. Far from perfect. But I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven and I'm loved. I just feel in my heart that someone is saying, I don't feel good enough to take communion today. Well, let me tell you, none of us are good enough. None of us will ever be good enough. But Jesus was good enough. Jesus made the supreme sacrifice to give everything He had to bring it all so that you and I would not have to. That we could live instead of die. Yeah, we're going to die physically someday unless Jesus comes back before then. But we're going to live forever in eternity, amen? With the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So today when we take communion, like I said earlier, I want it to be personal. Let's make it personal with God. Let's thank Him from the bottom, the deepest places of our hearts for all that He's done, for all that He gave. And it started with his body, this little wafer that represents his body. This piece of bread was broken so that you and I could be made whole. His body was willingly laid down. Nobody took Jesus' life from him. He laid it down. He gave it up knowing he was going to pick it back up. But he laid it down and willingly let it be beaten, let it be bruised, let it be marred. Because of His love for you today. For His love for me today. So this morning, as I hold this little wafer in my hand, it represents the body of Christ. Father, I pray in the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ, that His body that He willingly gave up, represented in this bread this morning. As we take communion in obedience to Your Word and out of our faith and love for You, Lord God, we remember what Jesus did for us. We remember your plan so that we could have an eternity with you. Father, I ask your blessing to be upon this little piece of bread. That you would bless it, that you would anoint it, that it would become all that you want it to be in our walk with you, in our life with you, in our faith to you. And I pray, Lord God, that we would be stronger because of this moment of communion with you today. And we would be more thankful and more grateful. I ask your blessing on it as we take it together in Jesus' name. Amen. This little cup of juice represents His blood that was given on the cross. Actually, I believe it represents every drop of blood that Jesus shed from the time they put the crown of thorns on His head, punched Him in the face, Drove the spike through his hands, his feet. Shoved a spear in his side. Every drop of blood brings forgiveness. There is life in the blood of Jesus Christ. And this morning we celebrate that life that he gave. In the blood that he was willing to shed for you and I so that we could be forgiven. We could be forgiven and with that forgiveness what Adam and Eve broke in the garden a long time ago was reconciled. We could be back in fellowship with Almighty God through the blood of Jesus Christ. He brought forgiveness. He brought reconciliation. So this morning, Heavenly Father, I lift this cup that you even call the cup of suffering. I lift it up to you, Lord God. It represents the blood of your Son. The innocent blood of your Son. And I ask your blessing to be upon it 
as we receive it together. I thank you for the forgiveness it represents and brings into our lives and our hearts. And I pray today that our lives would be richer in a walk with you than ever before, closer to your heart than ever before, as we remember your goodness, as we remember your love. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And I ask your blessing on it. In Jesus' name, amen. God is so good. Amen? He is so good. And, and I know it, and I'm pretty sure you know it too. We don't deserve one ounce of His goodness. But He's still good. He's good all the time. Could you stand to your feet? There's cup holders in the back of, you, of the chairs if you need to place your empty cups. But I'm going to close in prayer. And also, as we do every Sunday, if you need prayer for anything in your life, we'll be up front here to pray with you. I just want to say thank you for being here on Palm Sunday. And I just want to say that God loves you more than you could even imagine. And I want you to go out of this place today, and I want you to share His love with everyone you meet. Let God, He says, you open your mouth, He'll fill it. Just show them the love and grace and kindness of our Savior. Amen. Could you bow your hearts in prayer? Father, we love you today. We thank you for giving, you, giving your love to all of us through Christ's death on the cross. Lord, I thank you for paying the price for our sins and for our forgiveness. Help us to walk every day in a newness of life that comes through a relationship with you. Father, help us to grow closer to you each and every day. And may our lives bring you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.